dropped below 400. That was a okay. We're cool. back. This is the cube. This is the flash flash cube. This is Dave Vellante. I'm live here in Massachusetts, and my co-host and colleague John Furrier is in our studio in Palo Alto. Gary Orenstein is in the house. He's the senior vice president of products at Fusion IO. Longtime Cube alum, dating back to his uh, Giga Ohm days. Uh, Gary, good to talk to you again. Thanks for having me and uh, having us on the show, Dave. John, appreciate it. Yeah, always a pleasure. So, uh, what do you make of all this action and flash? All the big guys getting in. IBM's made you know a billion dollar investment. EMC made a lot of noise. Sort of aimed the EMC gun at you guys. Uh, well, Company F. I don't really know who that was, but. Um, you know, you must be excited. It's getting, it's getting interesting, Gary. What's your take on all this? I think it's great. Uh, it's in only just a couple of short years, we have gone from what some perceived as just a point technology, uh, you know, off in the corner of the data center to something that is now pervasive across uh, companies, both large and small, across the enterprise market, in the hyperscale market. And uh, you know it's hard to have a day go by without somebody uh, making some big news about the impact of Flash on the data center, on application processing, and you know we don't see these times that often in uh, you know following the technology trends, and uh, I think we've seen now by the activity, both the volume of the news as well as the uh, products and customer solutions that are being delivered that this is a, uh, a tipping point of how folks are going to architect for the future. Yeah, so you mentioned hyperscale. John Furrier, uh, John, you and I have been talking about hyperscale for a little while now, and, uh, and, and John, I know you're seeing some major trends there. What, maybe comment on that a little bit, and then uh, we'll kick it over to Gary. Yeah, I mean, Dave, as we talked about in theCUBE, also we just had OpenStack last week talking about the developer angle around building clouds, and you know, Gary and I, have, you know, known each other when the whole cloud movement was starting and it was just a small bunch of guys. This is before, you know, platform as a service took off. And what you saw was the beginning of a movement where people wanted to build high performance, high scale infrastructure. And that was mainly driven out of the demand for developers to essentially eliminate operations, but also the beginning of the hyperscale movement. And, you know, we've had Amar Abadala on from the founder of Cloudera, who was at Yahoo before, and Jeff Hammerbacher again, another co-founder of Cloudera, uh, at, at, was at Facebook, built their data groups. These web scale companies really set the standard for what is now hyperscale in the enterprise. And you're seeing that massive shift from open source to you know, scale out commodity or industry standard hardware, where you know you got on one end of the extreme, you got Google building their own stuff um, from down to the bare bones metal. And then you got uh, Facebook, which is simply assembling their own, since you're using commodity parts and writing their own software. So the big guys like Apple Computer, who kind of were pre-hyperscale generation, but then had to retool on the fly to support that massive growth. So you see those kinds of companies setting the stage for the Hadoop movement, for this new notion of using free software to really you know, save money and spend the time on engineering new solutions. And these new solutions are centered around Flash. So, so you know, obviously, you know, we're bullish on hyperscale open source. We think there's some compelling advantages on the cost side and also on competitive side with, you know, things like we saw Netflix, um, you know, announcing massive earnings, obviously the success of House of Cards. Uh, and, you know, as we talked about at the Cassandra Summit with the Netflix guys, you know, they were running the only Flash instance on Amazon Web Services, clearly a competitive advantage. So it's, it's as Gary said, moving from a point solution to a much more mainstream competitive architecture and now reference architecture. So those web companies are moving. So Gary, my question to you is, um, obviously those web companies set the stage for this new migration where there's no more tax. I mean, it used to be called the technology tax, no more sun servers, no more software. Now with open source, that got the developer movement. Now that whole nother tax level of conversations moving into the enterprise where people are saying, hey, I don't, I don't want to pay for Oracle. I want to get off Oracle, or I want to get off the VMware licenses. I want to get off these, these commercial software taxes to look more like Facebook, look more like Apple and, and Google, for instance. So, but not every enterprise can get there. So I want you to comment on the trend. Um, do you agree sure. scale out open source is a key driver? And what are some of the things you're seeing where the web companies are now showing the way for these, for these uh, uh, enterprises or these legacy service providers crossing the chasm, so to speak, and what are the dynamics? Yeah, well, the fun part about the hyperscale market to me is that it starts with us as individuals. Uh, we all have multiple mobile devices and we all demand access to data that's anything, anywhere, anytime. And when you know, people ask me about hyperscale to try to 
put a frame of reference or a picture in mind, I say, well, think about billions of people with billions of devices, all accessing applications that are going into the same data center. Because if you're using some shared application, like a social network or a picture sharing or something, you're going to that same place. That gigantic funnel is putting so much pressure on the data center to serve data more quickly. Now, it's also putting immense pressure on the companies that build those data centers to do so really economically. I mean, how much do you pay for all the web services that you use? You know, don't some you pay it. for, some you don't. Uh, so in the cases when you're not necessarily paying a tremendous amount of a subscription or a premium, their objective is to deliver as much data as quickly as possible, but also at the lowest cost. And infrastructure becomes a core competence. And as we've seen, some of these large companies have said, you know, I'm going to shy away from the proprietary boxes of yesteryear, maybe even last century, and I don't care so much about badges and bezels and any of that stuff. What I want is how can I achieve the maximum number of transactions at the lowest possible cost? Now, transactions can also be different things. Transaction could be a bank transaction, the way we think about the term classically. A transaction could be posting a status update. A transaction could be posting a photo. A transaction could be watching a video. All those things are transactions that are happening at the backend uh, application. And so what's important now is this relentless pursuit of more transactions at a lower cost. And we've seen that by using flash memory and using open source software, companies are able to achieve things that were previously impossible, uh, serving so many users at a price point previously unheard of, uh, you know, holding so much metadata to index all this information that they couldn't hold before. So those are a few of the big themes from my perspective. What, what are the examples can you share with us? I mean, first of all, I mean, obviously IT has always been slow and they've always spent money to save time because they didn't have the expertise They outsource everything. Um, now they're migrating over to the hyperscale marketplace um, of always on mobile. Um, Don Basile, your competitor, was just talking about these new software models that are emerging on top of Flash. So can you, one, talk about these new architectures and what are you seeing for solutions being deployed today in companies migrating over to this hyperscale market? And two, what are some of the things that enterprises and IT guys need to do to move there? Sure. <clears throat> you know, so some of the most common deployments that we see, you know, a very common one is just MySQL, right? MySQL is the world's most popular open source database. Just about every company that is uh, supporting any kind of web application uses some aspect of, of MySQL. And we have dozens of case studies of customers, uh, large and small alike, who have been able to shrink the footprint of their MySQL deployments. Uh, you know, supporting a, a voting application on 30 servers before you put in the Fusion IO products, going down to two servers after you put in the Fusion IO products. So that kind of consolidation in terms of the server savings for these companies is uh, enormous. Now, for the folks who are using uh, commercial software, they get, can get the same benefits too, right? Of where they previously might have had to have a, a certain size deployment in terms of number of nodes they're able to shrink that number of nodes uh, and get more value out of each individual server and each individual license for the applications that are at use. Now, in terms of the deployment models, I think now we're seeing the, the recognition that there is no one size fits all in terms of uh, flash memory deployments. And uh, we focus on really all deployment models for flash. You can use Flash inside your server as locally attached storage to provide the maximum amount of performance. You can use Flash inside your server and then software to transform that into a cache. So you could interoperate with an existing storage system and that's very popular in the enterprise market where they're looking to enhance, for example, virtualization solutions. They don't want to change out their infrastructure so they can deploy Flash as a cache. People do that a lot with our uh, IO Turbine software or folks want to deploy Flash in a mechanism that they can share that across multiple servers uh, in, in sort of a server Flash appliance uh, view. And we do that with software that we call Ion, or Ion Data Accelerator. And the nice part about it is that across these deployment models, Fusion IO provides an open software-defined platform uh, so that customers can choose whichever deployment model is right for them. We, we don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, but the flexibility to use the same underlying platform in multiple deployment architectures, uh, we find is very advantageous for both the hyperscale market as well as the enterprise market. So Gary, you, um, you guys made an acquisition recently of a company, ID7. Um, 
some people took notice, a lot of people were confused by it. Can you help us squint through what that acquisition was all about? Sure. So at the heart of many systems uh, that serve storage out over a network, so let's go back to the very basics. Um, <clears throat> if you have a server that has storage resources in it and you want to share those out over the network, you need to use uh, what <clears throat> is called a, a SCSI target subsystem. SCSI being the, the fundamental storage language that sits at the base of everything, including fiber channel is, you know, sits on top of SCSI. And so this core piece of software, was, which essentially allows the server to share its storage resources out over a network, is part of the uh, SCSI uh, target subsystem that uh, ID7 uh, built, and they maintain an open source version as well as an uh, ID7 version of that. That's something that we've been uh, cooperating on quite extensively uh, for our ION data accelerator product. And again, it's representative of this push to taking industry standard servers, infusing them with flash memory and software, and transforming them into super servers. Uh, we found that ID7 and the work they've done with SCST was by far and away the most robust and best performing implementation of uh, that, uh, that particular need of sharing uh, storage services out over a network. And you know, after cooperating with them, we decided to, uh, to take that relationship even further with the acquisition. Can you talk about um, the, some of the things that you're doing uh, in terms of contributions to the Linux community, in particular the kernel? Um, I think of you know the old days of paging and swapping, and they sort of went by the wayside when the disparity between spinning disk and and processor performance widened. Now that yeah. it's now that you, in particular, Fusion IO and some others are trying to close that gap, um, that piece of the kernel becomes more interesting. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I, I think it's also important to take a step back and recognize that we're out to improve the entire stack of helping people process more data more quickly and more efficiently. So that goes all the way from the underlying media to the, the, the flash chips, to the flash translation layer, uh, to the operating system, to the applications. Uh, there's nothing in there that you know is, is safe, so to speak, in terms of room for improvement. And we have a number of uh, open source contributors at Fusion IO who contribute to the Linux kernel as well as numerous other projects. Uh, we're big supporters of that effort. And there are, as you identified, cases where some of the uh, mechanisms in, uh, in Linux are, you know, just were come from a day prior to Flash being pervasive in the data center. And so in this uh, pursuit of, you know, getting rid of latency, whatever the uh, layer in the equation, uh, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of energy uh, contributing uh, to Linux, contributing to other uh, open source areas in order to, to basically streamline the stack. I think the important thing here is to remember, we often talk a lot about this as being a sort of a storage centric effort and I, I don't think that's always true. I sometimes joke with folks that this whole initiative is not about making storage go faster. It's really about making sure the application doesn't go any slower. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, the, uh, it's go, subtle, but that twist and that mindset uh, allows us to really leave no stone unturned. Uh, we don't have a legacy investment in uh, older storage architecture that we have to protect or propagate. We don't have investments in legacy RAID controllers and legacy SaaS and SATA storage devices. Our objective is very clear in helping customers process the maximum amount of data with the least amount of infrastructure, both the hardware infrastructure and the software infrastructure. As another example, uh, we're doing work with our software development kit to help reduce the amount of code that's needed to develop uh, you know, certain storage features and applications. So with MySQL as an example, by the way, the uh, MySQL conference is actually going on as we speak uh, down the road in Santa Clara. Uh, we've introduced capabilities like Atomic Writes that essentially uh, handle the atomic transaction for MySQL, what's the benefit to the end user? You know, it can be as much as a uh, you know, 2x performance gain. You reduce the number of writes by half. You double the endurance and lifetime of the media. So we're helping increase the performance. We're helping uh, make the solution last longer. We're helping uh, streamline the, uh, the code. So again, all of these things in this effort of squeezing uh, the very last bit 
out of the hardware and the software infrastructure. Yeah, now, um, you talked about atomic rights. We were t uh, by the way, we agree with what you said at the top of this broadcast. We were talking about the, the limits that, that spinning disk puts on, on application design, and it's really about, as you said, I like the way you said it, not allowing applications not to go any slower, but also there's such great potential to bring new applications to market. We had uh, Brian Bukowski on earlier from Aerospike. Uh, you guys are obviously the only one in market with the capability of atomic rights. And then we asked David Floyer about NVMe and you know, basically his, his short response was it's stuck in committees. So you talked about some of these legacy you know, uh, uh, RAID controllers and, and vendors. However, we would expect that you know, people are watching your moves and clearly others see the opportunity to, to, to develop capabilities not unlike what you have and try to leverage uh, their file systems expertise, their OS expertise, and maybe even put in uh, an infrastructure where you don't have to rewrite applications. Uh, we think of IBM in particular, uh, potentially even um, someone like VMware. What are your thoughts on that? What are you hearing in the marketplace? Uh, again, validation, but also competition. What's your angle? Well, I think anytime you're looking at deploying new technology, you have to straddle the need for integration with existing systems and applications, as well as the opportunity to break new ground. Uh, you know, there's another uh, joke I like to share, which is uh, everybody likes change. They just don't want anything to be different. And so we, we have to do that with the, the technology uh, advancements as well. So we need to develop solutions that will seamlessly fit with existing applications, but we also want to make sure that we can carry the industry forward, and, and sometimes that does involve change, and the good news is customers can choose. Um, let me give you a specific example. So when everybody introduced their first round of flash memory products, everyone made them look like a disk drive to the operating system. The, the flash appeared as a block storage device. And that was a great idea because applications know how to use a block storage device and therefore don't need to change. The difference is that most people not only made the product look like a block storage device, they also architected like a block storage device. And that's the one where I might have a difference of opinion from the way others have, uh, have deployed because we believe that flash memory can go far beyond what disk drives were capable of and even are capable of atomic rights being just one example. Uh, some of the work that we've done to showcase other capabilities that provide much more memory-like access to the, uh, to the media. You know, I, it's called flash memory, it's not called flash disk. So we have to move forward while retaining the ability to integrate with existing systems and existing applications. That's a balance line that I think we always face in the technology industry. John, you were at the OpenStack Summit last week and I wanted, wondered if you could uh, maybe talk about that a little bit and, and again bring Gary into the discussion on uh, Fusion IO's perspective on, on OpenStack uh, uh, generally and, and maybe even open source specifically. Yeah, Dave, I mean, you know, for the folks out there just tun tuning in, we were at OpenStack Summit all week last week for three days of live coverage. And we essentially sucked all the metadata out of that event, talked to all the people there, a lot of developers, a lot of signal, not a lot of noise, very relevant event. And what really is going on at OpenStack is we commented deal, uh, greatly, but go to youtube.com slash siliconangle, you'll see all the videos there. Um, I think we did 37 interviews there. But the main signal is people are building new infrastructure fast and it's based on scale out open source as we've been talking about, but what's really critical is it's not just one piece of hardware or one port on a switch that's software driven or whatever, it's an operating system. So the element of flash is a building block. So you're seeing architects, systems architects, all looking at cloud and looking at it from a perspective, holistic perspective and saying, hey, I'm going to build the next generation modern infrastructure. And they're looking at a longer term horizon and the arc of that conversation is, where am I, what do I need to do today to make my applications go faster, so performance is number one. And two, I want to be future-proof. I want enough headroom so I can get more stuff down the road. I, want to re, I don't want to re-architect. So the conversations are all about software, software architectures, layering in using open source, and using things like Flash. So to me, I think what's relevant, Gary, is the Flash conversation is about how do I build how do I look at it as a Lego block, a building block? So right. I want to get your comments on how you guys look at that market. Obviously you guys are a key ingredient. You're more than a hammer. You're, you're, you're a chainsaw for the old way and yet you know, big, big foundation for the future. So talk about 
um, the new architecture. Yeah, so what I see frequently uh, with folks is in deploying new architectures, they want to pick their favorite server or maybe one or two models of server. They want to pick their favorite hypervisor or cloud platform, OpenStack, we're a member of OpenStack, big supporters there. And then they want to fold services on top of that. That's kind of the model that I see. I want to pick my server SKUs, I want to pick my cloud platform or my hypervisor, and then I just want to fold services in. And I want those server nodes to be very flexible in order to handle a database workload or a web serving workload or maybe a storage serving workload. Now, in the conventional world, once I had built out that horizontal infrastructure of servers and I decide that I need to spin up a database that can support hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, in the old world, I would have had to wheel some full rack of SAN equipment in there and sort of you know, nudge it in between those skinny, thin little servers to say, I'm here. Well, you can't do that with a line of code. But if you've populated some or all of those servers that are in your scale-out architecture with flash memory, you can turn on a database to support hundreds of thousands of transactions with software. Or you can flip uh, you know, something to be uh, a web server that can handle a spike in traffic. Or you can flip something else to become, all of a sudden, a shared storage resource to support multiple applications. So to me, having the ability to have that infrastructure in place that can support uh, whatever's needed from a performance perspective, whatever's needed from a low latency perspective, is totally different from what we had previously when you know, we would have had to call the power company and the air conditioning company and get the lift in there. And you know, it could have taken three weeks just to get the equipment in there, now it can be dialed up with a uh, with provisioning software. So Gary, I want, I want to ask you, we talked we were talking earlier about some of the disruptive enablers, obviously the buzzwords are, you know, low latency, big data analytics. Um, but virtualization is a technology that's been around for a while, it's changing, but relevant in the software-led infrastructure. Talk about OpenStack in context to the data center. Can you share with the folks out there, you look at the product roadmap for Fusion IO, you got some visibility into kind of what's beyond just hyperscale web, but now enterprise hyperscale. How does that impact the data center? And, and how do things like OpenStack and say virtualization, as virtualization is changing from hypervisor licensing VMware to a complete commodity and or software centric world? Yeah, I think all of these initiatives around virtualization, OpenStack are all helpful to customers to give them options. That's what's important. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that customers can take those uh, those options in terms of how they want to architect their platforms, but do so in a way that's simple, easy, open, software-centric, uh, so that they don't have to continually rework the infrastructure. Um, so when we look at the solution portfolio and what we're doing and what we will be doing, it's a real focus on open software-defined enablement for people who want to choose the infrastructure that works for them. You know, some people like particular server vendor A, some people like server vendor B, some people want to do their own thing. For uh, Fusion IO, that's all goodness because we're enabling a platform that people can put in the systems of their choice. You know, we work closely with our OEM partners, we work closely with our channel, we work closely with our end customers so we can deliver a portfolio of solutions, flash memory solutions, software solutions, uh, enhancements to open source applications, and then let the partners and customers build what's right for them. It's really important that we're not mandating specific uh, you know, hardware architectures. We're not mandating specific deployment models. You have to deploy it one way or the other because the market is too uh, big and there are too many uh, options for customers to say it's going to be one particular way. But Gary, um Talk a little bit about, I mean, one of the things you do want uh, ISVs to do is, is write to your SDK and take advantage of your, your software layer. Can you give us an update on where you're at? I know you're making a lot of progress with, with MySQL, Percona. Uh, talk, update us on, on that initiative and, and any other action that you got going there. Sure, so the software development kit efforts we found have been most successful when we help uh, our customers integrate them into popular applications, so as you mentioned, uh, we've done a lot of work with MySQL, uh, including groups like Kona, also uh, MariaDB, uh, to take some of the functionality in terms of the atomic rights as one example and get that into the, uh, the mainstream distributions. Um, there's other uh, applications that we're looking at as well. Uh, we think there's opportunities with data stores beyond uh, MySQL. 
Um, you know, we're doing work with customers with Cassandra. We're doing work with MongoDB. Uh, we're doing work with HBase. So it's not limited to, to MySQL, but we found that the best way is for us to work with um, you know, partners to make that very accessible uh, for customers in terms of application packages. So that's been the primary focus. We're, uh, we're very enthusiastic about what's possible. Uh, again, not only uh, in terms of increasing the performance of these applications, which is important, but also you know, getting longer life from the flash memory, which is also important. Okay, right. so, so I have one question about um, Fusion. So how's David Flynn doing? I know he was traveling around the world lately. Um, we had a chance to bump into him last month, Dave and I, and he was uh, a little bit jet lagged, but he seems chill. He's very into the whole software model. What's on his mind these days? So I, I you know, you, you can call him up and, and ask him directly, but he's doing well. He does spend a great deal of time out with customers and, uh, and talking to folks to keep a read on the industry. So maybe you caught him at the, at the end of one of those trips. But again, as a company, we find that this movement to, to choice, this movement to open solutions, this movement to helping customers take the favorite servers that they've been buying for years and transform those with flash memory and software into super servers. That's a model that's been uh, working for us, uh, working with our partners, both our OEM partners and our reseller partners, as well as our customers. And I think across that spectrum of open software defined solutions for, uh, for folks to process more data and do so with less infrastructure, you're going to continue to see more innovations from Fusion IO along those lines. Excellent, all right, Gary, well listen, thanks very much. We really appreciate you coming by the studio in Palo Alto. Gary Orenstein, Senior Vice President of Products at Fusion IO, always a great guest. Uh, it's great seeing you again. Thanks very much, good to see you too, Dave. John, uh, appreciate the time. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back after this commercial break.